What is misinformation? Why is it so pervasive? And why is it so hard to address? Misinformation has become a significant issue around the world. The World Health Organization has called it an infodemic. This is how the Department of Digital Humanities at King's has made a difference in tackling misinformation. My name is Thais, I'm a research and digital journalist, and in 2019 I came to King's to learn more about how to investigate misleading narratives. So for my dissertation, uh, I used techniques from the field guide to investigate misleading narratives that circulated during the Amazon fires in 2019, uh, inspired by concerns from the European Forest Institute. After my graduation, I continued to work with King's and I collaborated as research assistant in the Infodemic project, looking at misleading narratives that were circulating in the Amazon uh, platforms and YouTube. Most of us are aware of the problems of spammy links, dodgy sources and misleading advice. We know this stuff is there, but how does it proliferate and do well online? Misleading content can make money. It can socially resonate. It can spread through bots and algorithms. It can pop up on devices that are with us constantly and intimately, or those of our loved ones. We can often be fooled about what's good health advice, or conversely, what might be just a blog post perhaps written by an AI and spread only in order to make money, or what might even be harmful disinformation spread by a conspiracy theorist. Conspiracy theory is a way of understanding the world which works on the assumption that anything important that happens happened because powerful people were secretly working together to make it happen. When I talk about conspiracy theorists, I'm talking about people who actually make a living from disseminating conspiracy theories. Not everyone realizes how bad content has overwhelmed our social media in recent years. Why is this problem flourishing? It's fueled by the different infrastructures put forward by the social media platforms. Devices that are with us constantly. We've been fooled by what is true and what's dangerous. Because it's dressed to look like innocent and attractive, we can just turn the web off. We depend on it. Viral junk news is flourishing, so we do have a problem. So what can we do about misinformation? The standard response is fact-checking. Uh, many common responses to misinformation is flagging out uh, bad content, and that is important, of course, but it is time-consuming and labor-intensive. Working as a digital journalist with misinformation can feel that you're constantly uh, in a walk a mole game, um, and that can be ineffective. During the pandemic, we had different teams uh, across different organizations working uh, to track down these narratives, but this can be unsustainable. As an arts and humanities researcher, we're interested not only in whether something is true or false, but also the context of a piece of content, where it comes from, um, who's made it, uh, who it's made for, um, how it might make money, um, and how it might be meaningful for different audiences. So while there has been a lot of really important work um, by fact-checking organisations and by others working with platforms to address online misinformation, by taking a holistic approach grounded in arts and humanities research, um, we wanted to tell different kinds of stories about uh, what this problem is and how it is that um, online misinformation is moving around online. So perhaps unsurprisingly, online misinformation publishers use the same kinds of technologies, infrastructures and monetization mechanisms to publish this material. Um, and indeed, it's the same infrastructures and mechanisms which enable it to spread and thrive online. One of the things that we found uh, was that there was a fake version of uh, Le Soir, uh, the website of the Belgian uh, media company, which was identical in design. It almost had the same uh, link. And this was not the first time, curiously, that this had happened. This was also something that happened um, in the Second World War, um, where a Belgian resistance group made a clone of a printed version of Le Soir um, by using the same typesetting, the same paper and the same distribution mechanisms. 
What we wanted to do was not just to go away and come back after a number of years with some research findings. We wanted to develop approaches, techniques and methods that could be used by media organisations, journalists, researchers and students to respond uh, more quickly to problematic misinformation being shared online and in depth and so that's why we developed the field guide as a collection of recipes which could be uh, used by others looking into online misinformation. The field guide is a collection of digital methods, techniques or recipes as we call them uh, that aim to show readers how to investigate online misinformation and how it moves around on the web and social media in different ways. It has also been translated uh, into a number of different languages and used by other researchers and students. So we did a collaboration with BuzzFeed News building on the techniques in the field guide and we found that online misinformation publishers were still making money using the same big advertising networks as they were before. And as a direct result of this investigation, BuzzFeed News were in contact with Google, who then turned off the monetization for these publishers. In a collaboration with BuzzFeed and Politico, uh, we found out that Amazon was being used as a hub for conspiracy theories related to the COVID pandemic. Their algorithms, comment sections and ranking features were suggesting uh, conspiracy books about the pandemic. So we are dealing with this really modern phenomena with overwhelming information infrastructures that are undermining health responses. Looking at YouTube channels of conspiracy theorists like David Icke, um, I found that they were benefiting from the way that the, uh, the YouTube comment interface worked. Because the thing is on YouTube, you can vote comments up, you can vote them down. And if they're voted up, then they appear higher in the list. So su uh, supportive commenters, people who enjoyed the video and agreed with its message, um, they, would, uh, they would post supportive comments and they would also upvote other people's supportive comments and downvote the unsupportive ones. And the result of that was that on one particularly racist video, I found that you had to scroll down over a hundred comments before you found one that was actually critical of it. And the top ones, were, uh, they were not only supporting the video and amplifying its message, they were actually even more racist than anything that was in the video itself. My research was cited in the successful campaign to get Ike deplatformed. Working together with civil society organisations, researchers have been able to assist in campaigns to get uh, some of the worst offenders deplatformed, or in less egregious cases, to have people remaining on the platform but uh, no longer to have their content promoted at the expense of good quality content. At the same time, King's researchers emphasise that it's important to protect freedom of expression and diversity of opinion. There's no ethical requirement to keep professional liars in business. But when one person's misinformation is another person's sincerely held belief, moderators have to tread very carefully and avoid anything that might look like censorship. The focus shouldn't be on purging wrong opinions, but on helping good quality content to reach an audience, even when it threatens to be overwhelmed by a sea of trash. That's why it's so important to work with reputable organisations that invest in good quality journalism. Academic research doesn't always lend itself to rapid responses. But with this project, King's researchers have been able to co-develop approaches for investigating online misinformation and problematic content that can be readily used by others whenever the need arises. This turbocharges the ongoing process of reporting and taking down content as it crops up. So research at King's has thus led to the development of shareable, actionable techniques which provide a unique perspective on how problematic online material arises, thrives, and how it can be tackled. How we can respond to it differently by understanding more deeply the problems and opportunities created by our connected societies.